Cox. I'm the Associate Commissioner for the Office of the External Affairs, and I have the pleasure today of hosting this very special occasion, the celebration of the 50th anniversary of a truly historic law, the Drug Amendments of 1962, or as they are better known, the Kefauver-Harris Amendments of 1962. As you will hear from our speakers today, this law provided the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and our agency, the United States Food and Drug Administration, with so many far-reaching and groundbreaking authorities that it is still viewed as fundamental to FDA's public health protection for all Americans. It is largely thanks to this law, which was sponsored by Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee and Representative Orrin Harris of Arkansas, and enacted unanimously by both houses of Congress that the United States today still leads the world in many aspects of public health protection. Now to start our historic, our historic legislative achievement, I'd like to ask the Honor Guard to present the flag and the Public Health Service Choral Ensemble to sing the national anthem. I'd like to invite everybody to please rise. Please advance the colors.
I said that the law we're celebrating today has advanced our public health system so dramatically that we're still benefiting from it in more ways than one. No one is better informed about the impact of the Keith Haver Harris amendments than our own FDA commissioner, Dr. Hamburg. Dr. Margaret Hamburg is a scientist, medical doctor, and innovative public health official who is building on the gains of the last 50 years by advancing the science of regulating products and making FDA truly a global agency. Dr. Hamburg? Well, thank you so much, Virginia. I want to add my personal welcome to all of our distinguished guests and my FDA colleagues, those of you who are here in the room with us today, and also those who are following this ceremony online through the webcast. Thank you all for helping to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Kefauver Harris Amendments, or as the law officially was titled, the Drug Amendments of 1962. This law, which as Virginia noted, was passed unanimously by both houses of Congress on October 2nd and was signed by President Kennedy eight days later, richly deserves to be celebrated. It is one of the most seminal federal acts of the last century. It has ushered in a process of enormous importance for our agency, and it has helped advance the public health, our economy, and American leadership in pharmaceutical science and technology. The story of how the amendments became the law of the land goes back really to 1956, when a German manufacturer introduced thalidomide, a sedative that rapidly became used throughout the world as a popular therapy for morning sickness in the first trimester of pregnancy. Within five years, the drug was used by thousands of future mothers in 46 countries, sadly, with disastrous consequences for many of their babies who were either stillborn or more frequently born with deformed and truncated limbs. The US was largely spared of this heartbreaking tragedy by FDA's drug reviewer, Dr. Francis Kelsey, a physician and former teacher of pharmacology at the University of South Dakota. In 1960, Actually, during her very first month as an FDA employee, Dr. Kelsey took the bold step of blocking thalidomide's marketing while insisting on evidence of safety. And when a growing torrent of reports about malformed babies bore out her position, FDA drafted legislation for keeping Americans safe from harmful drugs. These measures were adopted by Senator Kefauver a crusader for truthful marketing, and form the basis for most of the drug testing requirements of the Kefauver Harris Amendments. In retrospect, the enactment of the 1962 law can be seen as sequel to the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, which remains the basic statute of our agency. But while the FDNC Act completely reformed the public health system by greatly expanding FDA's responsibilities and powers, it had serious shortcomings that in fact stymied consumer protection. One very serious drawback was a provision that allowed a manufacturer to start selling a drug if the seriously shorthanded FDA, we were underfunded even then, if we failed to act within 60 days to prevent the product's marketing. Another weakness of the 1938 law was a lack of FDA authority to enforce good manufacturing practices. And in the absence of meaningful FDA authorities to oversee manufacturing and marketing, manufacturers could make fantastic claims for the effectiveness of their drugs, but sadly, not always true. There were basically no protections for patients harmed by the faulty medicines, and there, were scant, there was scant monitoring of the safety of drugs once they were in the marketplace. The 1962 law took steps to counter all of these drawbacks, but it did much more than that. 
The public outrage over the dreadful fate of the so-called thalidomide babies prompted Senator Kefauver, the chairman of the Senate Antitrust and Monopoly Subcommittee, to add FDA's carefully designed drug safety measures to his pending bill to enforce truth in labeling and marketing of medicines. The law that he sponsored jointly with Representative Orrin Harris the chairman of the House Subcommittee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce completely changed the FDA's regulatory environment. The key force behind this transformation was a requirement that new drugs had to be proven effective in the crucible of rigorous scientific investigation and be approved by the FDA before they could be marketed anywhere in the United States. In the highly specific language of the amendments, the claim of a drug's effectiveness had to be shown through, quote, adequate and well-controlled investigations conducted by experts qualified by scientific training and experience. The resulting evidence had to be sufficient to convince these experts that, the law says, the drugs will have the effect it purports or is represented to have under the conditions of use prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the labeling. With the passage of the amendments, FDA was no longer a helpless bystander while unproven medicines were streaming into pharmacies and patients' bedsides. FDA could now place a clinical hold on non-compliant trials. It could inspect drug facilities to enforce good manufacturing practices and it could insist on truthful advertising of prescription drugs. Most importantly, the new powers in the 1962 law bolstered an FDA capacity that makes our agency pivotal and fully engaged while advancing progress for the pharmaceutical industry and for the public health. That capacity was the talent of FDA's highly skilled scientists, policymakers, and regulators to initiate and adapt to change. This core strength of our agency was promptly tested by the severe criticism with which drug manufacturers, the American Medical Association, and others showered the Kefauver Harris amendments. The drug testing in particular was opposed as too expensive and time consuming, and FDA's approval process was criticized as too slow and too rigid. There were dire predictions that there would be a shortage of new drugs and the demise of the pharmaceutical industry as a result. In fact, though, the effects of the 1962 law were just the opposite. FDA rose to the challenge by dramatically streamlining and upgrading its processes. Within a year after the passage of the amendments, the agency issued its investigational drug regulation that firmly anchored drug development and evaluation in science. It was the critical step that helped to create the science-based agency that FDA is today. From the end of the 1970s on, our drug experts developed a series of new processes, such as fast track, accelerated approval, priority review, and treatment IND, that have significantly shortened review times and have made urgently needed medicines available in the United States faster than anywhere else in the world but always adhering to our standards of both safety and of efficacy. And in the last 20 years, FDA's innovations have completely transformed the way in which our agency operates. New programs provide us with additional product review resources and public-private partnerships help us to develop novel scientific tools for drug evaluation. We operate an unprecedented system of monitoring approved drug performance in millions of patients. We protect the public health globally, and we do it more scientifically and more efficiently than frankly was ever thought possible. There can be no doubt that the Kefauver-Harris amendments with its rigorous science-based standards triggered vast progress for FDA and for the public we serve. And notably, despite the initial skepticism, Kefauver Harris has had much the same effect on the pharmaceutical industry. To comply with the challenging drug requirements that Dr. Kelsey helped shape, firms greatly upgraded their scientific know-how, 
equipment strategies and processes. Arguably, the 1962 law laid the foundation for today's modern pharmaceutical industry, which is one of the most advanced and prosperous sectors of our economy. So this is a day to celebrate. Back in 1962, President Kennedy awarded Dr. Kelsey the Distinguished Federal Service Award, which is for protecting um, our country from thalidomide. This was really quite an extraordinary distinction for Dr. Kelsey personally and for our agency. But today, 50 years later, we have still more reason to remember the events of 1962. Today, we really must add our thanks to Congress for passing an act that made possible truly magnificent progress that has enabled us to fulfill our continuing mission to promote and protect the health of the public. So I really thank the organizers of this session because it is a rare and extraordinary event to celebrate. And I will turn the podium back to our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Hamber. We are exceptionally fortunate today to hear from a member of the House of Representatives who was in Congress when the drug amendments of 1962 were brought up for a vote. Congressman John Dingell voted yes, the same vote he cast for scores of proposals to strengthen the public health since he was first elect elected to Congress in 1955. Mr. Dingell is today the Dean of the House of Representatives, the longest currently serving member of Congress, and I am proud to add a staunch supporter of FDA. He is unfortunately unable to be here in person, but he has provided with us a video to share with you all. Mr. Dingell, please. Today, Americans take it for granted that the drugs and other medical products that they use are safe and effective. Things were different during the early 50s and the early 60s. Before that, they were even worse. Almost any new drug a company wanted to market could be sold to consumers. There were few rules, and companies had little guidance from FDA about what evidence was required to show that a drug was safe. All that changed on October 10, 1962, when President Kennedy signed into law the Drug Industry Act, often called the Kefauver Harris Amendments, after the bill's two authors, Senator Estes Kefauver, a Democrat from Tennessee, and Representative Warren Harris, a Democrat from Arkansas. The Kefauver Harris Amendments to the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act were nothing short of a revolution for the FDA. Under the bill, the drug manufacturers, for the first time, were required to prove that their products were not only safe, but were also effective before FDA approval. In celebrating this 50th anniversary of the Kefauver Harris Amendments, we must take time to recognize the significance. The law created an environment in which FDA and today's sophisticated biotech and pharmaceutical industries can cooperate to develop complex and innovative medicines. Indeed, the Kefauver-Harris Amendments have helped to make FDA the premier consumer protection agency and have set the stage for the United States pharmaceutical and biologics industries to be recognized as the world's gold standard. Today, Americans take it for granted. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Steven Spielberg, FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco, who joined the agency after a long career as an academician and scientist, and scientist specializing in pediatric issues. Dr. Spielberg will tell us about the importance of the Kefauver Harris Amendments for biomedical research, a field that is his specialty. And I'd like to invite Dr. Spielberg to join us. Thank you, Virginia. You know, as this afternoon, as we celebrate Keith Farver Harris, I'd like to share with you some personal reflections 
on the legislation and the events surrounding the legislation. I was very fortunate in being able to attend the University of Chicago to do my MD and PhD in pharmacology. And every morning when I took the elevator in the research building up to the fifth floor, which housed the Department of Pediatrics and walked across the hall into the library, there was a picture of Dr. Francis Kelsey receiving the President's Medal from President Kennedy. Dr. Kelsey was the first graduate student of that department. But the story doesn't stop there. Her mentor was a gentleman who had too many names, Dr. Eugene Maximilian Carl Geiling. Uh, Dr. Geiling was the second chairman of a Department of Pharmacology in the United States, the first being John Jacob Abel at Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Geiling arrived in the 1930s in Chicago as a new department chair, his first student being Dr. Kelsey. And in 1937, there was an outbreak of deaths, mainly in children, associated with a new formulation of sulfonylamide, the remarkable wonder drug that actually worked to treat infectious disease. It was put up in a very tasty vehicle, ethylene glycol, which unfortunately is also very toxic. And it was Dr. Geiling who in 1937 figured out the mechanisms of toxicity and that it wasn't the sulfonylamide, in fact, that it was the ethylene glycol. And that led to the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1938. So Dr. Geiling and Dr. Kelsey and the University of Chicago somehow ended up intimately involved in the creation of the FDA and the legislation that led to the FDA. And my chairman while I was there, Dr. Lloyd Roth, who is a young chemist, spent World War II in Los Alamos working on the Manhattan Project, then went back to medical school and became a pharmacologist. On practically a daily basis, told the graduate students about the importance of science and about the importance of public service and about the importance of the FDA. And years, many, many years later, when Dr. Hamburg first called me and asked if I would be willing to serve the FDA, uh, it was pretty obvious what the answer was going to be. Uh, when your mentors have infused you with a love of learning and a love of service, and how the two can be melded together and must be melded together if the public health indeed is going to be benefited. Well, with that as background, and thinking back about the legislation, both in 38 and in 62, and as a pediatrician, I'm struck by two things. One is that legislation can indeed change the world, and we're enormously grateful to Congress for having done this. And the second thing is that the legislation did very little to the inciting events leading to the legislation. The needs of sick children for improved therapeutics and formulations of medicines for children, an understanding of the lives of fetuses in utero and how to properly and effectively and safely treat pregnant women would wait for another day for more science for more legislation. But having said that as well, if you look at what the Key Farver Harris Amendments meant to us, the requirements for well-controlled studies, somebody sitting and looking at a well-controlled study in 1960 would barely recognize what it means today. And what it means today has been driven by all the people here at the FDA as well as by our colleagues in academia and our colleagues in industry and regulators around the world. It is you who have changed the nature of that science to update that science. Interesting irony, it never says too well controlled studies anywhere. That was an interpretation of what was needed and replication in science is perhaps the major form of flattery for anyone who publishes anything. Somebody else can replicate it. But we've learned different ways of doing clinical trials. We've learned how to use genomics. We've learned how to use proteomics. 
to look at the human population in ways that we could have never imagined when I was a graduate student back in the 1960s. Uh, and when we look at our clinical trials and the creativity that has occurred within the FDA during that period of time, it is truly remarkable and should be an enormous source of pride to anybody who has been here at FDA and who is here now. So while we're celebrating something that happened in 1962 in the Key farber harris Amendments, I think the operative aspect of celebration is to celebrate the Food and Drug Administration and all the people dedicated to making it a preeminent public health agency and advancing the treatment of all those in need. Thank you very much. And now we have a, a special guest who has come here all the way from Montreal. I'd like to invite Mercedes Benegvi, who is going to say a few words on behalf of the Thalidomide Association, Victims Association of Canada. Mercedes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I wish to thank you with all my heart for this lovely invitation. Thank you for having thought of us, the Canadian survivor of the Thalidomide tragedy. On this great day, it would be sad to remind ourselves that the greatest achievements, the major changes, inevitably follow the worst catastrophes, or Taking things from another angle, we could say that the United States was fortunate to have in its service a Canadian woman whose intelligence and rigor enabled the American people to be protected from the larger scale effects of the worst catastrophe connected with the inordinate temerity of the pharmaceutical industry. However, I prefer quite simply to mention, without going into further detail, that I would have preferred the voice of Francis Kelsey to have had the same degree of resonance in Canada. Her voice called for the emergence of many initiatives and measures to promote public health and safety and ends the necessity for proper assessments of the inequity and inefficacy of drugs. We should remember the wisdom of Mr. Kifover and Aris for the excellence of their initiative with the enactment of the 1962 drug amendments, rightly named after them to replace the 1938 Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act following the Thalidomide tragedy. Up to now, this regulatory tool has very likely contributed to saving human lives and to improving the health condition of many Americans. We need to keep moving in the same direction. I wish to thank the FDA, which over the years has agreed to hear the positions of Canadian thalidomide survivors on the risks connected with the marketing of thalidomide, as well as the risk connected with the development of generics of this notorious teratogen. I believe it is a sign of respect, but especially a great, of great wisdom to listen to the various opinions and positions including those of a unique group of individuals who survive dreadful mutilations caused by one of the worst teratogens, thalidomide, a catastrophe that could and ought to have been avoided to a large extent at the international level. 
the messages of TVAC will always come as a reminder of the need for the greatest possible vigilance and sense of responsibility on the part of all the agencies concerned in all stages leading up to the marketing of drugs. While drugs have the potential to soothe or to save lives, they can also destroy thousands of lives within a fraction of a second. It is only in a spirit of rigor and partnership, taking into account the expertise of everyone involved, that the greater interests of public health will be upheld. Otherwise, it would be all too easy to let certain things slide. Never forget that your country, the, the United States of America, was a model of rigor and tenacity throughout the world when the Thalidomide tragedy occurred and that you have the duty to maintain it. It is by no means a coincidence. Born in the same year, it is an honor for me to share my well-earned 50 years with the Kefauver Harris Amendments Act. Thank you and best regards to all Americans. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And now I'd like to invite uh, Deborah Otter, FDA's Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Global Regulatory Operations and Policy, who will say a few words about the 1962 amendments effect on FDA's ability to enforce the public health laws. Thank you, Virginia. Good afternoon. Uh, so many people have now spoken so eloquently about the great importance of the Kefauver Harris Amendments. I want to go into some of the details about what they've meant for FDA and for its industry oversight. First, the thalidomide tragedy itself created a significant challenge for FDA field staff. Over 1,200 physicians have been given thalidomide in the U.S. for testing, but without a meaningful tracking system. This one led one FDA investigator to note, I cannot help but have doubts about the adequacy and effectiveness of the recall procedures followed, since no formal letter was used, no material was returned, and there's no record or information as to how much material was destroyed, if any. In response, on July 27, 1962, the FDA's Bureau of Field Administration directed district offices to find and remove from circulation all thalidomide stocks that were unaccounted for by contacting each of the 1,200 physicians personally. In fact, the situation was so dire and complex that when asked a question about the litamide in his press conference on August 1st, 1962, President Kennedy himself urged all women around the country to check the family medicine chest to make sure the drug was turned over to the FDA. Implementing the efficacy requirement for drugs that were already on the market was also a massive undertaking for the agency. Many of you are familiar with the Drug Efficacy Study Implementation, commonly known as DESI, that FDA undertook after the 1962 amendments. The DESI program was intended to review all drugs with new drug applications marketed before 1962 and determine whether there was evidence of effectiveness for the drugs labeled indications. Those drugs had been approved for safety, but their efficacy had never been reviewed. The DESI program took a great commitment from FDA staff for more than a decade and required collaboration of FDA review divisions, compliance, investigators in the field, and countless others. DESI evaluated over 3,000 separate products, and by 1984, the agency had completed the majority of its reviews. Of the over 16,000 therapeutic claims, 60% of the claims reviewed were considered effective. But notably, only 12% of the drug products that had pre-1962 approvals were found to be effective for all of their indications. Over 1,000 of the products were removed from the market as lacking evidence of effectiveness for any indication at all. 
Other parts of the 1962 amendments have also continued to have a major impact on FDA's industry oversight efforts. One notable requirement relates to drug manufacturing. Tragedies that predated thalidomide built a case for needed enhancements in the quality and the manufacturing of pharmaceutical products. In 1941, because of poor manufacturing control, sulfathiazole tablets were contaminated with phenobarbital, leading to nearly 300 deaths and injuries. This, coupled with the firm's serious problems in attempting to recall the tablets, caused FDA to drastically revise manufacturing quality controls, the beginning of what would later be called good manufacturing practices, or GMPs. Another significant case occurred in 1955, after Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine. Manufacturers quickly ramped up production to meet public demand for the vaccine. But one company failed to inactivate the virus completely in one lot during production. That failure led to 94 inoculated patients developing polio, 166 of their family members subsequently contracting the virus, ultimately leaving 192 people paralyzed from the vaccine. Although the term good manufacturing practice had been used in essence for some time, in 1962, in the amendments, Congress broadened the statute to include the term current good manufacturing practice, or CGMPs. The word current is important. It means that as the science and art of drug manufacturing progress, industry needs to keep up and to progress also. In addition to CGMPs, the 62 amendments contain other significant developments for industry oversight. U.S. drug manufacturers now needed to register annually with the government and make their manufacturing records available, and FDA now needed to inspect U.S. drug manufacturing facilities at least once every two years. As Congress stated in its report in 1962, drugs should not be on the market unless the FDA knows who's making them and where they're being made and is able to inspect the facilities in which they are being made. Finally, the keefe harris amendments also gave FDA a strong role in overseeing clinical research. This happened in part due to thalidomide and the work of Dr. Kelsey, when investigations found that clinical studies involving this drug had not been conducted in a rigorous scientific fashion. One physician who was testing the use of thalidomide in, the US, in U.S. patients admitted he did not keep records of his use of the drug and often transmitted any research findings by telephone or even during a round of golf. Shortly after the 1963 investigational new drug regulations were in place, a small investigative unit was formed to begin looking for suspect clinical investigators who could be conducting poor quality research. That unit, titled the Division of Scientific Investigations, now the Office of Scientific Investigations, was headed by Dr. Kelsey, and the nickname Kelsey's Cops was born. Later, that blossomed into an agency-wide program of clinical trial oversight. So how does it all look today? We continue our efforts to ensure that drugs are not on the market unless they have been proven safe and effective. In part, to enforce the keefe harris requirements, in 2006, FDA announced a new drug safety effort, the Unapproved Drugs Initiative, designed to remove unapproved drugs from the market through a risk-based enforcement program. To date, the Unapproved Drugs Initiative has taken a variety of enforcement actions, including 20 drug class actions that have impacted over 1,200 products and 200 firms. Perhaps even more importantly, because of the initiative, more than 123 drug products that were previously on the market without FDA approval have now obtained required FDA approval. Just this year, under the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, or FDASIA, drug registration requirements have been strengthened and clarified. And the definition of current good manufacturing practices has been amended to explicitly include quality systems and risk management. And today, our drugs are made all over the world. 80% of our active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers are outside of the U.S., and we import 40% of our finished drugs. Drug quality is now a worldwide concept, and we increasingly work through global collaborations, such as the International Conference on Harmonization and the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, to converge our CGMP requirements with standards set around the world, fostering a culture of quality worldwide, while also creating efficiencies for regulators and for industry. We continue to inspect drug facilities as required in the 1962 Act. In fact, FDA conducted nearly 3,000 drug inspections in 2011, a quarter of them outside of the U.S. And again, the Keith Oliver harris two-year inspection requirement was changed this year by FDASIA. The law now recognizes that FDA must oversee all drug manufacturers, whether they are domestic or abroad, and do so based on risk and not the calendar. As for clinical trials, there too, we are collaborating with our international counterparts to protect patients globally, this includes cultivating novel clinical trial designs, developing innovative tools to aid in inspecting studies around the world, and fostering a quality systems approach 
that promotes innovation and research while ensuring high quality data for decisions on drug approval. In short, the world continues to evolve, but our modern system continues to rest squarely on the foundation put in place by the Kefauver-Harris amendments. That law created a modern drug regulatory system, which is integral to today's efforts to address challenges and protect patients in a complex, globalized regulatory environment. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. I know we have many FDA alumni here today, and I want to thank everyone for coming. Today, we are very fortunate to have Joseph Levitt, who's chairman of the board of the FDA, FDA Alumni Association, say a few words um, on behalf of the FDA alumnus. Uh, Joe served in many senior positions here at FDA during his tenure, including in the Office of the Commissioner, Deputy Director at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, and as Director of the Center First, uh, first food safety and applied nutrition at Recifsan. So, Joe, please. Thank you. It is certainly a pleasure to be here today, and certainly my role as chairman of the FDA Alumni Association, which, as many of you should know, or hope you, I'll tell you now, we have literally hundreds of people who are former FDA or some current FDAers. Um, I tend to think that our motto ought to be, you can take the alumni out of FDA, but you can't take the FDA out of the alumni. I know that I personally always feel rejuvenated whenever I have an occasion to come back to FDA. And so I'm particularly happy to be here. Um, you should know that we hold monthly meetings and luncheons with FDA speakers. We have an, now an annual spring fling with Commissioner Hamburg that has really become a special treat for us. We have an international network, the Florence Ho Heads, that, that educates um, foreign governments and industries and FDA regulatory practices as far as China. Uh, more, most recently, we've been asked to provide uh, some names of ex-reviewers to help the tobacco program. So we feel very much connected and part of the, uh, of the FDA. Um, I also want to take a moment and recognize one particular person for his role in drug efficacy and drug regulation over his entire career, and that is Dr. Richard Kraut. Dick Kraut, who's here, is a former... <laughs> Dr. Kraut headed the Bureau of Drugs when I first came to the FDA in 1978 and certainly presided over many of the activities that we're talking about today as we were talking just beforehand, so I will give proper attribution, um, that, uh, as Dick likes to say, the adequate and well-controlled study standard was truly transformative in how it affected medicine and how we have studied drugs ever since, and drugs today are much better than they ever would have been if we'd not had that. And uh, it's an example, again, as he, I think, so well said, it is an example of regulation done right. And how many times at the FDA do we hear people saying that about us? <laughs> so regulation done right ought to be one of the taglines for this program. What I thought I would do here, um, as Virginia said, many of you know me as uh, former director of the Food Center, but I actually began my career um, as a drug lawyer. Um, in 1978, they had just passed the uh, Supreme Court cases that upheld the adequate and well-controlled study standard and formed the basis for many years to come. But what also happened was the drug efficacy amendments were really challenged during the 1980s. And it's really a testament to an iconic law if it withstands the test of time. And one incident that I just want to convey and describe and just kind of remember is really when FDA alumni stood up for the drug efficacy amendments and helped uphold what they stood for. Um, some of you may remember something called the INDNDA rewrites. These were simply more or less fairly straightforward uh, revisions of the regulations that had been on the books for some time in parts 312 and 314, if I remember correctly. Um, and in 1987, the last one was being published, the IND rewrite final regulation, without a lot of fanfare. Um, but then somebody uh, at the White House kind of got a bright idea. They, they thought uh, drug lag was a major term out there. 
It was blamed on the drug efficacy amendments. All this work had to be done. It took much longer. People in Europe get things much quicker. Apparently, they forgot about thalidomide by then. Um, and somebody had the bright idea to change the IND regulations so that drugs could be literally commercialized in the IND process. And in terms of when during the process, like maybe right near the end, well, maybe not quite at the end. Uh, and the standard actually was going to be that FDA had to prove the drug was ineffective. Now, if you think about that, those in the drug area, how is FDA ever going to do that? And so this really was a, a clear attempt to have a go-around of the 62 drug amendments. Well, the FDA commissioner at the time, Frank Young, would not go along with that. But the accommodation that was reached was that it was, the idea was put out as a reproposal. And I will tell you, once that reproposal went out, you know, the public outcry was unbelievable. And it was led by the FDA alumni at the time, former FDA commissioners and former FDA chief counsels. And every living former FDA commissioner, whether they were appointed by a Democratic administration or Republican administration, all joined in a common letter to Congress that was presented by Peter Barton Hutt and Richard Cooper, again, one from a Republican administration, one from a Democratic administration, that said, this must not stand. It is bad for medicine. It is bad for consumers. It would totally undermine drug effectiveness, and we must not let it occur. And those comments form the basis of what then became the final treatment IND regulation that went back, if you will, to the way the agency had wanted it and said that for drugs to be uh, allowed to be distributed more broadly, there must be sufficient evidence of both safety and effectiveness. And yes, you must take into account the severity of the disease, other alternative therapies, and so on and so forth. But the burden must remain on the manufacturer to establish the data, and that the um, uh, treatment IND, I think, has been a successful and a forerunner to other things like fast track, accelerated approval, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, that retained the fundamental credibility and integrity of the system. Um, and so uh, that was something that um, I, shall we say, witnessed firsthand as being in the commissioner's office at that time, as, as uh, Virginia remembered. Um, and I wanted to share that with you today. Um, I think certainly in my role as in the Alumni Association, um, I'm certainly proud that alumni, you know, joined with the FDA to make that happen. But I think I'm even prouder of all the work that all of you do every day and have been done for the last 50 years and will do for the next 50 years. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Joe. As you heard from many of our speakers today, the effects of the 1962 amendments were vast and important. I'd now like to invite Dr. Doug Thurk Martin, who's our Deputy Director in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, to share his perspectives on some of the contributions these amendments have had on medical research and its impact on modern medicine. Doug? Thanks, Virginia, very much. It's an honor to be here today to hear all of the wonderful testimonies about the impact that the Kefauver Harris amendments have had on the FDA's mission and on medical products development in the U.S. Um, I'd like to offer just a few comments coming from the leadership of CEDAR, or the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. The history of drug development in the United States is one of continued progress punctuated by transformative events. And the Kefauver Harris Amendments passage is one of those transformative events. Um, we're here to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Um, I've seen firsthand the impact that the passage of that act in 1962 had. Um, and I'd like to add my voice to those celebrating it and to highlight some of the tremendous progress in evidence based medicine and impact on public health and point to the many important drug developments for patients that have occurred as a consequence. As a result, the FDA is the gold standard. Our review process, our drug development process, is considered the standard by which other parts of the, the world aspire to. First, 
the Kafavra Harris amendments fundamentally changed how we develop and use drugs in the United States, beginning with the requirements that products demonstrate efficacy before they're on the market for a defined patient population. Meeting this standard required the development of a whole new science, a science of trials conduct, of statistical analysis, of the randomized controlled trial, as others have said. Things we take for granted. I began my career as a reviewer in, in the part of the FDA that develops drugs for cardiovascular medicine. The randomized controlled trial by that time was standard fare. We understood that. We couldn't imagine a time when it wasn't part of the day-to-day -day discussions we had with developers. Um, Dr. Spielberg is right. A, a person from 1960 or the early 1960s looking at the kinds of sophisticated trials that we today, do today wouldn't understand them because the science didn't exist. We hadn't thought through the various things that needed to occur before you could conclude that a drug was effective for a population that you could define. Um, that is a tremendous achievement, an achievement that we use every day to provide the greatest possible assurance that the drugs that we put on the market are effective and useful. Other important changes in the drug, drugs development came about as a result of the 1962 amendments. Um, for instance, drug companies not only had to provide substantial evidence of efficacy, but they needed to report to us about adverse effects um, during the post-marketing periods. Additionally, information on safety and, and effectiveness needed to be submitted to us in, adva in advance of marketing, as I'd said before. This assured that there was expert review by FDA scientists prior to exposure of the public to those, those drugs before they were used by thousands or potentially millions of patients. The 1962 amendments also ushered in new requirements to protect patients in clinical trials, as well as to, provide the, to improve the information given to patients about the drugs that they take. First, the law required that people who participated in clinical trials did so after they were given informed consent after they were told what was known about the usefulness of the drug as well as the potential risks of the drug. Uh, we take informed consent for granted these days. It is a profoundly important aspect of clinical trials, protecting the people that are willing to engage in clinical trials to further medical development, medical development and medical products development. Um, additionally, we were given authorities to look at advertising, to make certain that advertising that was done by companies about medical products on the market was balanced to reflect what was known about the effectiveness of the product as well as the, the known adverse effects that could happen when they were used. As we celebrate the passage of the 1962 amendments, we also need to remember the people behind the events, the people who continue to inspire, to inspire the work we do, the work that I do every day. The story of Francis Kelsey is one that we talk a lot about in CEDAR. As I said, I began my career as a primary medical reviewer, and the story of her courage resonates with all of our medical officers and our other scientists because it's a story that embodies the enormous responsibility that we have as individuals, as individual reviewers working within the FDA. Her courage is captured in the FDA mission, which continues to focus on making certain that the benefits of medical products and drugs outweigh the known risks. Her courage is also reflected in the work done daily by the incredibly dedicated staff working in CEDAR, working in the FDA, who make the amendments a part of their life as they come to work every day. I couldn't be prouder to work with the individuals that I am. Without a doubt, then, the confavor harris amendments have changed new drugs development in ways that could not have been anticipated when they were passed in profound and wholly positive ways. As a scientist and physician, I can't imagine the job we do and trying to do it without those innovations. Nothing will ever replace the rigorous evaluation of safety, quality, and effectiveness that happens at the FDA as a, before a drug can be sold. This is a fundamental. Today in CEDAR, we are working to, on several initiatives to build on those fundamentals to enhance the development of drug development in the US for the patients who need them. For instance, through our 21st century review process, FDA is continuing to make certain that the drug review process is not only rigorous, but it's also efficient. Through our Safety First initiative, we're working to ensure drug safety continues after a drug is on the market by continuing to look at them carefully for safety and new events that we need to understand after patients are taking them. 
Armed with that information, we're also working to improve how we communicate about the use of drugs throughout the life cycle, from the beginnings of its exposures and development through the many years after the drug is on the market. And as always, we're paying attention to the quality of drug manufacturing because quality is the underpinning of all of the things that we do. The results of these efforts are borne out in the innovative, life-saving therapies that we're able to provide for patients, for people who need them. Our dedicated staff continue to apply the science that, comes, come, that came about as a result of the kefauver harris amendments to speed efficient medical products development. Singling, singling out of individual products is very hard for me, but last year FDA brought out around 40 new molecules, new medicines, uh, medicines in critical areas of need like cancer, cystic fibrosis, and devastating viral infections like HIV and hepatitis C. These are drugs that matter for diseases that need effective therapies. And we accomplish these approvals standing on the foundation laid by the kefauver harris amendments. On behalf of, of CEDAR then, I want to close by thanking all of you for your participation in this important event today. I am proud and honored to be part of the FDA organization and to work with the dedicated staff. Together we are all working to build on the kefauver harris amendments to fulfill the FDA mission and advance public health by helping to speed innovation to make drugs more effective, safer, and more, fair, and more affordable for the American public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. I'd now like to invite Commissioner Hamburg back up, who uh, she will re help us recognize all the, FD the contributions of all the FDA employees over the years who have had such an impact on making the amendments a reality and so impactful to public health. Thank you. I th believe that we've heard many powerful testimonies to the importance of the Kefauver Harris amendments and to the power of FDA employees to make a difference in the world, to bring science in the service of the public and of humanity. Um, and to reinforce the very important and unique mission of the FDA to promote and protect public health. It's a great honor to be able to award the Francis O. Kelsey Award, which was actually first given to Dr. Francis Kelsey herself um, at an FDA event honoring her at the age of 96. Um, this was held back in September 2010. The award was created in honor of Dr. Kelsey's achievement in preventing the drug thalidomide from being marketed in the US and was designed uh, to really give us an opportunity to recognize the contributions of an FDA employee each and every year as together um, FDA employees strive to really fulfill the mission that we have here and to build on the great accomplishments of Dr. Kelsey. Our speakers this afternoon have really illustrated um, the importance of her seminal contribution and of course the, um, the legislative actions that came subsequently. But I think our speakers have also spoken to the critical work that happens every day here at the FDA um, as we are so deeply involved with the drug development process, uh, drug review, and drug approval, always remembering why we're doing it, which is to bring the best, the most innovative, the safest, um, and the most effective products to people who need them and who count on them. FDA employees working today are making a huge difference. But as we reflect in this historical context on all that's been accomplished, we also want to recognize FDA employees' past and the many contributions that have been made um, by people who have worked hard during their tenure at the FDA, continue to support the FDA in critical uh, ways now, but today are part of the FDA Alumni Association. So we decided, moving a little bit afield from the original vision for the Francis O. Kelsey Award, 
that we would in fact award it to the FDA Alumni Association. Um, and I think it's very, very fitting to acknowledge um, FDA employees, current and past, in this way. So it is an honor to be able to ask Joe Levitt to return to the podium um, and to ask him in his role as chairman of the board of that association and if he wants to bring others up with him, um, uh, that would certainly be appropriate. Some of you seem hesitant, but um, <laughs> uh, anyway, we do have this, this award. Um, the, Dr. Francis O. Kelsey Award for Excellence and Courage in Protecting the Public Health. And today, I would like to present it to you on behalf of the Alumni Association. And I think we'll do a formal, the occasion merits a formal picture. completes our commemorative program, but not our appreciation of the service of so many who made these amendments possible. On behalf of FDA, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on this special occasion, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.